Hey, are you tired of the left and right politics? I hope you'll subscribe to my YouTube channel. Just click that subscribe button, ring the little bell, and prepare to free your mind from the traditional red versus blue. I'm a fan of D.L. Hughley. D.L. Hughley is one of the original kings of comedy. He's a radio host. He's a best-selling author. He's a deep thinker. None of that has anything to do with why I'm a fan of D.L. Hughley. I'm a fan of D.L. Hughley because in 2006 or 2007, I made my first appearance on Real Time with Bill Maher. And it did not go well. In fact, it was ugly. And it was ugly in retrospect because, and I've watched it, although, you know, it's taken on a life of its own on YouTube because people love seeing me get a smackdown from Mar. Mar perceived me, I think, to be a religious fundamentalist. And I think it was also at a time when he was doing a movie called Religious. So he beat the crap out of me on the 10th, uh, the 10th Amendment. Listen to me. <laughs> that's where my <laughs> that head is. It. Yeah, that's my world, <laughs> the 10th Amendment. Uh, on the Ten Commandments. And DL, who was on, uh, who was on stage with me, pretty much came to my defense or at least said like, stop the fight. And TC, you know what I'm referring to. Yeah. So it's interesting on YouTube. It's just mentioned, it's just labeled Bill Maher on the 10 commandments, but there are over 267,000 views of this video. I'm, gl I'm glad it's only that many. Let's listen. <laughs> I believe so, in the 10 commandments. So like you can't work on Sunday and you can't swear and you can't make statues to other gods. I, I think it's a, I think it's a, a good way to lead your life. You follow those, you're, you're going to be better than if I'm you I'm asking, don't. those things are important to you, not swearing and not working on Sunday and not making statues to God. Bill, I, I didn't want to get diverted on the Ten Commandments. I believe I'm just asking you if those, those, those are, you. if but you I'm, had to make a list of the ten most I, I important things to, in the world, you'd leave off rape and, and child steal. abuse, but you'd put in no swearing and not working on Sunday? What I'm trying to you tell you You motherfuckers need to calm down. That's what you need. I'm telling you. But see, I, I just, nobody ever gives you a straight answer on Jim. You know That's you, all I'm saying. You know what I think? That's D.L. Hughley. And by the way, the brand new book is How to Survive America. D.L., it's great to have you back. Thank you. How you doing, man? I had not even do you happen to Do you remember that night? I did not, man. Uh, but, you know, I, I remember meeting you. I didn't remember. And I remember Bill doing the thing. I, I just, that kind of escaped me. It was. It, it did get a little. In other words, you 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 for, you forgot the white guy that you threw a lifeline to, just to sort of free him from the wrath of Bill Maher. I do it so much, you know what I'm saying. It's just so hard <laughs> to keep keep track of of all the things that I that I've done. No, I I remember I, like I remember around it. I just didn't remember how uh, how uh, how. It, oh man. I, it was embarrassing. I, and I, I had friends in the audience that night. Uh, Maureen Faulkner, lover, longtime friend, she and her husband, Paul, and they came back to the green room and they looked at me. Maureen looked at me and, and DL, <laughs> her eyes were as wide as saucers. And she said, you were great. And I thought, oh, my God, her mouth is saying one thing, but those eyes are telling me the real story. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, I read the book. It's a very, you know, I, mu I must say you, you really threaded a needle here because the book is funny. It's satirical. It's also an assault on the idea that blacks deserve their lot in life. So my first question is, who's the audience for, the, is, it, is it me, a white guy from suburbia, or is it somebody who is living into the, in the inner city? Um, you know, I, when I, I was, as I was writing the book, I had no intention of writing another book. I was promoting my other book, Surrender White People. And then I got COVID, of course. <laughs> and so I was, I was quarantining from COVID. And I see uh, the Surgeon General of the United States, uh, Jerome Adams, go on TV and proceed to tell Black people and Brown people uh, to stop smoking and drinking and doing drugs. Um, which was tantamount to saying that was the reason why we were disproportionately affected. But now he since the next day after backlash uh, walked that back. But it was interesting how a, a pandemic that was ravaging the world, uh, uh, the, the Europe was shut down and no one else, no other government official in any other country came out and made any kind of assessment like that. They made, they, they, they made any kind of, they made no proclamations like that. But when it comes to black people in America and the way that we were disproportionately affected, Somebody from that administration marched out and said, well, this is why. And um, 
I think that in doing research for the book, you see that that's a common through line, whether it's the Spanish flu uh, uh, at the turn of the century or, or what's happening now, Black people have always been disproportionately affected by these things. And there was always this kind of, well, see, that's why. And I, I don't care what, what, it, what it is, it, it is that the fact that Black women die disproportionately in childbirth or that we are that we have childhood asthma or that we're prone to obesity and high blood pressure all of these things are say that there are inherent failings in us that cause these things and it doesn't require a look at the uh, external circumstances so here is DL Hughley's epiphany moment it's april 2020 Jerome Adams is the surgeon general it's a 20 second clip let's listen stay at home if possible if you must go out, maintain six feet of distance between you and everyone else and wear a mask if you're going to be within six feet of others. Wash your hands more often than you ever dreamed possible. Avoid alcohol, tobacco, and drugs. And call your friends and family. Check in on your mother. She wants to hear from you right now. Avoid alcohol, tobacco, and drugs. What was he saying, DL? Well, basically that that was what, what we were being, suffering from. Listen, I, in that same uh, 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 press conference, he pulled out an uh, aspirator uh, because he admitted he had asthma. And I guarantee you it was childhood asthma. Now I guarantee you at a very young age, he probably wasn't drinking or smoking or doing drugs. It was his environment that, that predisposed him to that. America always looks, in my estimation, uh, even if you look at what happened with George Floyd, there was a medical expert that actually got on TV that said, oh, it was a carbon monoxide or the fentanyl or the enlarged heart or any other reason other than the fact that there was a man with his knee on his back for nine and a half minutes. And I think that's been the way it's always been when, when women die of childbirth. Uh, you know, the fact that if you look at our history here, corporate America, like, like even when we look at the, the reason there's vaccine hesitancy, Johnson and Johnson uh, introduced, kept the product on the market specifically designed uh, to get marketed to black and brown people when they knew that it was harmful to them, black and brown women, they knew it was harmful for the, to them in baby powder. And now those same people are making a vaccine. So even though I know that they're different, these are the kinds of connections that, that we have to make. And these kinds of, these kinds of, these, these waters we have to kind of navigate where you have, even the idea of us being like the, the idea of wearing a mask seems normal to you. But when you put on a bandana and you're a black man and you walk into a, 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 a bank or a gas station, it takes on a more sinister tone. Like they had to, the, fed, the uh, feds had to send out a memo saying, hey, these black people are gonna be wearing masks so it ain't always criminal. I, I think that the way America has always, we've had this kind of dance where nothing that happens to us is, is anybody uh, anybody's fault or external circumstances other than our and, and throughout the whole book, I mean, that's what it is. It's you using your wit, using your intelligence, using your humor, but essentially saying, hold on, you know, hold on. Black people in America, uh, black women in particular, they come to their fear of doctors naturally. And let me tell you why through a historic lens. It, it, uh, even if you look at what's happening recently, just, just yesterday, uh, a couple of days ago, they passed, they unanimously passed uh, the Juneteenth to, to make Juneteenth the federal holiday. We didn't ask right. for a holiday, yep. we asked for justice. We didn't ask for that. We asked, <laughs> that's like getting your Amazon, getting your order wrong and say, well, keep it anyway. Like we didn't ask for that. We asked for accountability, we asked for justice. More white people will get the day off of slavery than black people will. <laughs> like that's crazy. Like, 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 so there are these, there is a duality that when you're black or brown in America, that we haven't quite reconciled ourselves with. I think that we have on one side of the ledger, but America is, is they seem reticent to take a look at and even, uh, you know, kind of dissect what, what this nexus is. Do you think that be, being able to bring the humor entitles you or enables you a better word to reach more folks? I, I remember DL when years ago with one of my prior books, I wanted to say something about the partisan media and as I started to write the book as a work of nonfiction, it occurred to me that I could take a many more liberties. I could cuss, I could throw in some sex if I would write a novel. And so I did that. And I'd like to think that I reached more people by approaching it differently. In your case, because you're a natural born comedian, it's a very funny book, but my God, I find myself laughing about black on black crime. 
I think that it has always been the way I've dealt with it, dealt with it, dealt with everything. I mean, I remember uh, from a, a very early age, it had always been. Uh, my mother used to give us aspirin and orange juice, and that was kind of my uh, my analogy. Like she used to give us something we 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 needed in something we liked, and I think humor has kind of been always that through line for me. It's always been the way. I don't know that I deliberately have done it, but I've just seen nothing seems more ironic than a stark truth. <laughs> like nothing seems, and so there, there is, there are, there are moments that just the treacle has to be cut, and there are moments where that are so dark and stark that that it calls out for a moment of of levity. The heaviest of lifting in the book, because you you deal with environment. You talk about the neighborhood where you grew up. You told that poignant story about going back to your elementary school and the number of books has not increased. I mean, I, I read and loved all of it, but it's the crime conversation that I, I think people will find most provocative. For example, you write, quote, talking about black on black crime is just a way to talk to white people to pretend like he cares about black people while also dog whistling that black people are violent and you go through the data and the explanation what's the short version of what you argue in how to survive america well ultimately it is this whenever there's something that happens say a police officer kills somebody even in sacramento chicago's invariably the topic they always go well look at what happens in chicago Eric, right. what you're saying is that all black people are criminal even if it happened that you're making when, when we talk about drug use, West Virginia is rife with drug, drug use, but it isn't what the moniker of all that goes on in America. For us, black on black crime is basically uh, the, the ad hoc thing they use to use to, to have carte blanche to do whatever they want to us. That's like saying all black people are incredibly, inherently criminal and they all have to be dealt this way, dealt with this way. And it may be harsh to you, but that's inherent in them. That's the way they are. There, there, there's a moral failing in them that makes them predisposed to being violent. And so this is the way we deal with them. And, and it's not even a dog whistle, it's very overt. Um, you, I heard Bill Barr uh, say as much in an interview, what about black on black crime? It's crime is about proximity. It's, it's, if, if, you were, if something were to happen to in your, somebody in your family, they would look at the people closest to them. And when they talk about uh, if, the biggest uh, indicator of crime it's not racist poverty. Show me a safe, poor neighborhood. And, and, but they never make these, these things that they know to be true, but they give them carte blanche to do whatever they want. I, I, I just, it's, it's, it's farcical to believe, uh, unless you inherently do, that these people, either, either, these, either, either us as Black people are morally flawed and inherently uh, criminal, or America has done some pretty monstrous things. And I think, they would they they tend to fall on that side of the ledger. DL, while I was reading the book and while I was reading that particular section, I went to Google and I typed in black on black crime just to see what would pop up. So it was primarily a number of, of academic sources and, and some hate-ish kind right. of stuff. Right. But the fifth entry, I thought you'd find this interesting. The fifth entry was FBI data. I don't know why, but from 2016. I, I would normally say that must be the year for which they have the most recent info, but probably not. But okay, so it's FBI data from 2016. Here's what I found that the number of white folks who were murdered that year, 3,499, what was the race of the perpetrator 2,854 times somebody white? Black or African American in that year, how many murdered? 2870, 2870. What was the race? Just like with the white folks, 2570, Black or African American. Sure. The point being, and I, I know that there's an issue here as to what group are most likely in gun homicides to victimize others, but I think that it's a pretty simple truth that we kill our own. Well, you know, it's, it's so funny when we talk about uh, uh, ethnic cleansing or when we talk about the gang wars in, 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 in Mexico, the drug wars in Mexico, those are all uh, people who are killing people who are in proximity to them. Um, uh, and, but you take lack of resources. I wanna, it's always interesting to me when everybody, they need to put the guns down and turn violence off in these, in these urban cities. What the proportionate to violence is poverty. 
proportionate to violence is lack of opportunity. Their environment. More, a lot of men and women in prison have uh, high concentrations of lead uh, in their bodies. So they, they ingest concentrations of lead, which, which kind of are geared toward, they work on the part of the brain that make us more criminal. No one ever thought about cleaning up the environment. Nobody ever thought about taking the lead pipes out of these urban environments and that uh, joint, or, or, or sussing out people who are predisposed to having uh, some kind of learning disability. Um, and, and, you know, and they start acting up and that becomes more criminal and it, 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 it is, it's still, but there is a, no matter what happens to us in America, there are people who pull these facts out or they cherry pick these, this data. And then they say, this is why you are inferior. You're inherently criminal. And this is why you must be dealt with this way. And I, so nothing, nothing uh, demonstrated that point more clearly to me uh, uh, than the pandemic. Um, that, that people were leaving Jerome Adams, stay at home if you can, if you could. A, a, a lot of black and brown people could not work from home. They were in the service industry. Uh, uh, they lived in close proximity. Look at all the things that it was, it was affecting people who were in close proximity, these multi-generational homes or these urban environments where people live right on top of each other or prisons or boats where all these people uh, were places where black and brown or even, even uh, convalescent homes or old folks homes, these people in close proximity uh, on top of each other with, you know, not people who didn't quite care as much. And also they were people who were being warehoused and America kind of went, ah, it, it's a shame, but not as bad as it would be if it were the natural resources of this country or the national treasure of this country. I'm not going to give it all away for free. Just, just one more quick vignette from how to survive America. You were having, I think it was a stomach ailment. Your doctor is not sorting it out. He's keeping his distance from you when you go in for what you would think would be the exam and you later see him, you tell the story, you'll do well, a better I, job than I ever could. I, uh, I was having uh, stomach problems and I go to uh, uh, a, a doctor's office in West Hills, California. Um, this doctor, he was the doctor on my HMO, so I go, he never touches me, never touch, from the door. He would was, he was, he was look at <laughs> me and kind of, I see a young doctor walking by, his name is Dr. Mark right. Lapp. He was a kid, he looked like Doogie Howser. And I go, hey man, are you a doctor? He said, yes. And I tell him what's going on. He said, well, you're somebody's patient. I said, this guy won't even touch me. He, he does this exhaustive stuff, finds out I had a gastrointestinal uh, infection that we sorted out fairly quickly. And he became my doctor. And later on, he became a concierge doctor. And he was my, when I, I joined the country club in Calabasas, the same doctor who wouldn't treat me finds out I'm famous and goes, why didn't you, you know, you, you were my, I heard, understand you were my patient. I said, you would never touch me. Well, you know, it, it, you know, I, and he, 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 he remembered what happened, but he had no uh, reasoning. There's no reason for a doctor <laughs> to not touch a patient. That's, that's kind right. of animal to what being a doctor is. And um, had I not had that kind of care, I mean, obviously uh, it worked out. And now that doctor is my, my, my doctor, my, my um, daughter lives in Atlanta. She still flies in to see that doctor. He's our, he's our internist. He now has a concierge service, but just the idea they're going to seek medical attention and having the research, like saying, I have a HMO, I have the, I can get, just having that wasn't enough. I still had to have somebody who believed that I was worthy of care. I, I take it there's no foursome that ever went out on the course at that country club with that that uh, no, initial with, doc. Not with him, not at all. Not with <laughs> him. That was when I was eight hey, handicapped, so he wouldn't play with me anyway. Yeah, well, I'm a 27, so I don't think you want to play it with me. OK, unless you're gonna, uh, unless you're looking to take money off of me, Absolutely. which is likely. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. It's nice to see it. The book DL, it's a terrific read. It, it is uh, somehow you threaded the needle. It is funny as hell. And yet it is really serious subject matter. So I congratulate you. And I hope I see you again soon. Likewise, man. Maybe we get on the court. We can get on the course after we play Bill Moore, after we do Bill Moore. It'll be great. Yeah. It, only if you come to my rescue again. Absolutely. Thank I got you. Thank you, DL.